Red Reward by Mitchell Scanlon. They had come upon the body by chance, buried in frozen mud. It had been found by two guardsmen as they hurried to resurrect the fallen wall of a firing trench in the lull between orc attacks. But for the man whose remains now lay at their feet, there would be no such resurrection. Only reburial in some less vigorously contested section of the city with just a battered set of dog tags to give name to the dead. It is Rakael, Sergeant, Trooper Davir had said, standing over the body that was still half concealed in the mud of the trench floor. Or, oh, that's what his dog tags say at least. Now his own mother wouldn't recognise him, even from the lip of the trench wall above them. Chalka could see what Davir meant. Rakael's face was only a memory now, his features reduced to a gruesome flattened smear marked with the striated imprint of the thing that had killed him. Could only have been an orc tank, ventured the hulking guardsman to Devere's side. A battle truck. Look, you can see the marks of its tracks on his face and what's left of it. It must have rolled over the trench while Rakael lay underneath. Then the trench wall collapsed and the poor bastard was crushed. He would have seen it coming too. A bad way to die. Bad way to die, my ass. Devere spat. Flat, ugly features alive with sudden anger. You know a good way, Bullivan. We're all poor bastards. And whether we die or we throats cut, heads blown off or crushed like Raquel here, is beside the point. It's all the same in the end. Phew. You feel that way about it? Why don't you end it all now, you stunted idiot? Bullivan rumbled back. Put yourself out of all our miseries. Because, uh, my fat friend, it is well known that the average orc can hit its own ass with both hands and a guided missile, while I, as you so charmingly put it, am a stunted idiot, a small target, one who confidently expects to outlive you all, I might add, especially you, Bullivan. A blind man with a thrown rock and the palsy will be a hard press to miss your broad and capacious backside. Enough, Joker said with a quiet force, to let the squabbling pair know he meant it. I want a four-man detail to move the body and bury it by the old plasteel works. Devere, Bullivan, you have both just volunteered. You may choose the others yourselves. And before I hear anyone complain about how hard the ground is, I want you to remember something. Rakael was one of our own. Without another word, two more guardsmen jumped into the trench to join those already there. Then, with as much reverence as was practicable, given the conditions, all four set about the delicate task of extricating Rakael's remains from the mud. Occasionally a spade head would strike a particularly hard-packed knot of earth, the impact shivering painfully up the handle to the hands of the digger. Then there might come a muffled curse, but for the most part they worked in silence. Four men, mindful of their duty to a fallen comrade, and the code between all the defenders of this battle-scarred city. We bury our dead. But by then, Chalka had already turned away to supervise repairs to another part of the company's defences. The last attack had been a bad one. Twelve men dead, thirteen counting Rakael. And with the remorseless logic of this place, Chalka fully expected the next attack to be harder and more ferocious still. It was the way of things here, in the city of Vrosherak. A man could rely on one thing at least, each new day would be worse than the last. For a moment, casting tired eyes over the wearyingly familiar landscape around him, Chalka found himself distracted. Before him lay no man's land, a great grey expanse of frozen mud and mounds of rubble, punctured here and there by the fire-blackened silhouettes of dead orc vehicles, while behind him lay Brocherock itself, an endless, seemingly all but abandoned cityscape of ruined and Burned out buildings. A ghost town, thought Chalka. And we are its ghosts. Sergeant? Turning, Chalka saw Corporal Grishin hurrying towards him from the comms dugout. Four unfamiliar guardsmen trailing in his wake like black-coated vultures. He did not need to see the crossed swords and prayer beads insignia at their collars to know who they were. Kessrian guard. Or to know their arrival here could only mean trouble. What is it, Grishin? Plainly discomfited, as though struggling to find the words, Grishin paused before answering. Behind him, the Kessrians stood in a rigid line, with hell guns held at waist level, their safeties off. And, 
Though not normally given to nerves, Chalker could not help feel a certain unease to see the muzzles of their guns seem to be pointing his way. We have received a message from Sector Command, Sergeant, Grishin said, fidgeting as he spoke. Well, two messages, actually. The first is a communique forwarded from General Headquarters, a fought for the day to improve the morale of the troops. The message reads, it is better to die for the Emperor than to live yourself. I'm sure the men will find that very comforting, Grishin, Chalker said, doing his best to keep any trace of sarcasm from creeping into his voice. And the second message. The second message is from Commissar Valk at Sector Command, Grisham replied, lowering his eyes as though suddenly noticing something of interest in the mud. It instructs that uh, you are to be disarmed and placed under arrest on charges of heresy and treason. These men have been sent to escort you to Sector Command for interrogation. And Sergeant, uh, they have orders to shoot to kill should you try to resist. Yes, the guns were pointed his way, all right. Here in the rubble-strewn streets behind the front line, amid the warrens of ruined tenements once used to house the city's workers, Chalker could see some signs of life at least. No, life was too strong a word. There was movement. Weary guardsmen huddled around braziers for warmth. Militia auxiliaries dispiritedly hauling supplies. Even the occasional feral child hunting rats. But it was all no more than the last twitching spasms of a vast and dying corpse. Had every man, woman and child still alive in Brusharok gathered in the central square, no one could have mistaken it for anything other than what it was. A gathering of the dead, like grimy-faced shades who refused to face reality. They were ghosts, these people. Ghosts with pulses, perhaps, still able to love and laugh, even bear children. But ghosts, just the same. They, and their city, lived only through some quirk of borrowed time. One day, the big push would come, and Brusharok would fall. Then, whether by the orcs, or at their own leader's decree, these people would go in to join all those who had gone to their deaths from this city before them. Although Chelker was forced to admit, even these ghosts probably had one advantage over him. They, at least, might live to see tomorrow. His captors had stopped short of putting his legs in irons. That was something. But Chalka knew better than to see it as any great cause for hope. It was a practical matter. They would have to walk to Sector Command, after all. And if his escorts did not want to carry him, his legs would need to be left unfettered. On his hands, though. There, the Kazarians had followed regulations to the letter. It was a new experience, walking these debris-choked alleyways with hands manacled behind him. Already he had suffered several bruisingly abrupt encounters with what propagandists like to call the sacred ground of Brusharok. Enough to learn that the frozen soil was every bit as impregnable to the sudden impact of a human face as to the blade of an entrenching tool. But even the taste of his own blood, and the painful awareness that he had probably broken his nose three falls back was not the worst of it. Chelker felt naked. He had been a guardsman seventeen years, the last ten spent bottled up in this damn city by the orcs, long enough to know there was no way worse to get killed than to be wandering around unarmed in the middle of a war zone. Your gun is your life. Lose one and you'll soon lose the other. It was a lesson every guardsman lived or died by. A lesson Chalka had learned as a snot-nosed recruit on his first day of training, courtesy of a kick up the arse from his drill instructor's boot by way of emphasis. A kick that had probably saved his life a hundred times since. In the last 17 years, wherever he ate, slept, washed, even in the latrines, his shotgun, hell pistol and knife had been his constant companions. Now, without them, Chalka knew what it was to lose a limb. He felt a sense of incompleteness, a phantom itch, impossible to scratch. Get up, damn you, one of the Kessrians barked, hauling Chalka painfully up by the arms in the wake of yet another fall. And next time be more careful where you put your feet, he added. Apparently convinced this constant headbutting of the ground could only be some act of ill-conceived defiance. Other than that, and the occasional sharp dig of a gun muzzle against his back, his escort seemed disinclined to converse. 
what contact Chelka had had with the Kessrians in the past convinced him this was more blessing than curse. They were humorless fanatics, dour even by the standards of Brucherock. Where to live at all was to live with the threatening weight of despair constantly at your shoulder. Some men succumbed to it, ending their days with the barrel of their own las guns clenched between their teeth. Others sought refuge in false hopes, gallows humour, or a simple dogged refusal to die. But not the Kesrians. They were devoted to the imperial creed and lived with all the mean smugness of men who believed they need only follow orders and come deaf. They would sit with their emperor in paradise. Though perhaps there was a subtle wisdom in their piety. Counted the most loyal troops in all Brucherock, they had been detached to permanent service to the city's commissars, while more suspect troops like Chelka and his men suffered the brunt of the fighting. Still, their silence was a mercy. He might have to endure the Kessrians taking him to the gallows, but he saw no good reason that they should be allowed to try and bore him to death first. Keep close, a Kessrian said. If you run, we must shoot. For a moment, Chalker wondered why the man thought it necessary to state the obvious. Then, even with his nose broken, he could smell the stench of burning orc flesh and knew the corpse pyres were close. They turned a corner, heading up towards a low hill, whose summit was shrouded in an acrid haze of smoke. But he did not need to see through it to know what they would find at the top. The corpse pyres. Great burning mounds of dead green-skinned bodies dragged here from every corner of the city. Through the smog, Chalker could see the outlines of perhaps half a dozen such pyres, each containing a hundred alien corpses or more. And for every mound he could see, a dozen other pyres might be hidden in the smoke. As many as ten thousand orcs might lie burning here, but they were no more than drops in the ocean. For every orc on that hill, a thousand more waited outside the city. Once they would have smelt like victory to him, Chalker thought. I'm past such delusions now. It was a tradition started in the first days of the siege. Every morning, guardsmen armed with long hooks would collect the orcs killed in the previous day's fighting, drag them up the hill, stack them in great mounds, douse them in Prometheum, and then set them alight. At first, it had been done to prevent disease. This city manufactured so many corpses that they could not all be left to rot in the streets. Then someone, a commissar, most likely, had proclaimed the corpse pyres were more than just an act of hygiene. Brucherac was sacred ground, he said, sanctified by the blood of all the heroes who had died defending it. And to bury even a single alien here would be to dishonour that sacrifice. Only heroes were worthy to be buried in Brucherac. The bodies of the alien scum must always be burned, both to preserve this sacred soil from their taint and so the orcs outside the city would see the smoke rising on the wind and know what awaited them. So went the dogma, anyway. Chalker could not help but reflect how ten years of corpse burnings had done little to dissuade the orcs thus far. But there was a certain symmetry to it. Brucherac had once been one huge refinery, where crude from the oil fields further south was brought to be refined into fuel. Even now, the city sat on billions of barrels worth of Prometheum in massive underground storage tanks. That was why the orcs were here. Without fuel to feed their armour, their assault elsewhere on the planet had been brought grinding to a halt. They were here for the Prometheum, and thanks to the inspiration of some long-dead commissar, every orc that died here got some small taste of the stuff. They were at the summit now, the air about them thick with smoke and drifting fragments of ash. Eyes watering, almost retching from the stench, Chalker could see ghostly figures moving through the haze as masked guardsmen worked to add more orcs to the fires. The heat was stifling. He was sweating under his greatcoat. Here in the warmest spot in all of Brucherock, the city seemed even more like hell. Then he felt a stern hand suddenly grip his shoulder as though his escorts were afraid they might lose him. But they were wrong to think he might run. Where could he go? Between Brucherock and the Orcs, there was no escape. For better or worse, Chalker would have to put his faith in Imperial justice. He was covered in bruises, and every part of his body ached. On arrival at Sector Command, Chalker had been delivered to the custody of two new guardsmen, who had promptly taken him to a cell, stripped him naked, then beaten him bloody with fist and club. Softening him up, they called it. Groin, stomach, kidneys especially his kidneys. They had done their work so well 
Chalker had no doubt he would be in tremendous pain for a week, always assuming they let him live that long. Now he lay prone on the stone floor of another room, waiting for Commissar Valk to acknowledge his existence. A thin man, with thin lips and nose, the Commissar sat at a desk at the other end of the room, eyes glued to the display screen of the data slate he held in his long, thin hands. Silent minutes passed as the Commissar kept reading. Then, without raising his eyes from the screen, he spoke in a voice every bit as thin as his lips and nose and hands. Bring the prisoner a chair. The guards complied, dragging a chair to the middle of the room, propping Chalka up in it with a hand on each shoulder. But still the Commissar did not so much as glance his way. Instead, keeping his eyes on the data slate, he leant back in his chair and began to read aloud. Eugene Chelka, Sergeant 902nd Varden Rifles, with service in the Mursk campaign, Bandar Majoris, the Solnar Restoration, and most recently Brucherok, decorated six times, including the Emperor's Star, with Galaxy Cluster, presented for extraordinary bravery in the face of the enemy. Though never convicted, you have also faced disciplinary proceedings six times in the past, on charges ranging from insubordination to failure to salute an officer. You would seem a remarkable study in contrasts, Sergeant. I wonder, which is the real Eugene Chelker, the hero or the malcontent? With that, Valk finally looked his way, but Chelker stayed silent. The time for expressions of love and loyalty to the Emperor would come later, for now, better to hold his peace until he knew the substance of the charges against him. For a moment, the Commissar stared at him with cold, piercing eyes, the smallest touch of a graveyard smile twitching at the corners of his lips. Valk turned away, then pulled open the bottom drawer of his desk. He lifted out a Vox recorder. Setting it on his desk, Valk fussed for long seconds, ensuring the recording spools were aligned and the long wire of the Vox receiver properly connected. Then, pressing a stud to set the device working, he turned back to Chalka once more. There now, Sergeant. I see no reason to delay the start of these proceedings any further. Speaking clearly and being careful not to leave anything out, I want you to tell me about your dealings with one Lieutenant Loranus. Chalker slept a deep and even sleep, a sleep untouched by dream or nightmare. He slept cocooned in blessed moments of peace. Then he heard Corporal Grishin's urgent voice in his ear and knew his sleep was done. Sergeant, a message from Sector Command. Orspex has picked up an object falling to Earth in the northwest quadrant of the sky. A drop pod, sir. With a start, Chalker awoke to the darkness of the barracks dugout. Grishin's voice buzzing insistently in his comlink's earpiece. He dragged himself from his bunk. Then, after grabbing his shotgun, helmet and greatcoat, he stepped blinking into the grey light of dawn outside. Although still half asleep, what came next was second nature. Half crouched, and keeping to cover as best he could, he ran zigzag across the open ground between the dugout and the fordmost trench. Upon reaching the safety of the trench, he found Devere and Belarvan waiting within. I don't see anything. Belarvan said, squinting up at the sky. The pod is too far away, pig brain, Devere replied, perched on a stack of empty ammunition boxes. And anyway, the corporal said, Northwest Quadrant, you are looking at the wrong part of the sky. Belarvan made some unpleasant comment about Devere's parentage, but Chalka ignored them. Had he even wanted to follow the progress of yet another of their endless disputes, now was not the time. Not with Grishin's excited tone still pulsing in his ear. It's one of ours, Sergeant. Command is sure of it. We are awaiting verification as to its contents, but Rorspex has it on a vertical bearing of 49 degrees. I say, 49 degrees. You should be able to see it soon. Raising his field glasses, Chelka scanned the foreboding heavens. There, he saw it. A black speck, haloed by flame. A drop pod, all right. And it was headed their way. Perhaps it is a relief force, Belarvan said. His usually booming voice now an awed whisper. A space-borne assault to destroy the orcs and break the siege. We have a single drop pod, Devere sneered. I find such stupidity surprising, even from you, Belarvan. Most likely some distant bureaucrats decided to send us a supply pod 
to reassure us we have not been forgotten. Something remarkably useless, no doubt, insect repellent or paper clips. Remember when they sent us a whole drop pod full of prophylactics? I never could decide whether they wanted us to use them as barrage balloons or simply thought the orcs must have a morbid fear of rubber. Still, whatever is inside this one, I shall be content so long as the bastards have aimed it right and it doesn't land on top of us. The drop pod was closer now, and visible to the naked eye, with a tail of fire streaming behind it. It looked like a comet. Glancing at the network of trenches and foxholes around him, Joker could see dozens of fur-shrouded helmets peering over parapets as every man in the company craned their heads up towards the sky. Everyone seeing in this man-made comet some different portent, whether for good or ill. All but Joker. He had lost his faith in portent some time back. You are an evil runt, De Vere, Bullivan growled petulantly. It would kill you, wouldn't it, to leave a man's hopes intact? I'm doing you a favour, Belarvin, De Vere shrugged. Hope is a bitch with bloody claws. Still, if you must hope for something, hope the Greenskins never develop a fat-seeking missile. If they do, you're f- Silent! We have verification, screeched Grishin in his ear. So excited now, the top end of his voice became a squealing squall of static. They're reinforcements. Command says the drop pod is full of troops. Thank command for the good news, Grishin. Chalka said into his comlink mouthpiece, but advise them they may wish to post more men on grave digging detail. The pod looks set to land smack in the middle of no man's land. The pod fell closer, and with every metre a roar grew louder. It was big now, so big Chalka could pick out the design of the Imperial Eagle embossed on its side. An eagle reefed in flame, and about to land right under the orc guns. Take cover! he screamed. There came a deafening boom and the whoosh of air as the shockwave passed overhead. The ground quaked as the tremors subsided. Chalka stuck his head back over the parapet. He saw no sign of casualties among his men. The pod had landed so far away the tidal wave of uprooted earth and stone had fallen short of their lines. Ahead, Chelka could see half buried in a newly created crater, steam rising from the rapidly cooling hull. For a moment there was silence, the air itself seemingly as frozen as the ground underfoot. Then the orcs opened up with everything they had and the apocalypse began. Bullets, rockets, shells, even the occasional energy beam fell roaring all about the pod turning the ground around it into a churning sea of leaping soil. As ever, orc marksmanship was appalling. So far, they had not even come close to hitting their target, but given the sheer volume of fire, it was only a matter of time. Sergeant! Grishin screamed through the static. I have battery command on the line. Permission to request artillery counterfire. Negative, Grishin. Their marksmanship is every bit as bad as the orcs. We must give those poor bastards out there a chance at least. I want you to take a range estimation on the centre of No Man's Land and await my instructions. Out in No Man's Land, the pod doors opened, disgorging shaken guardsmen, seemingly leaderless, confused to find themselves delivered into the middle of a firefight. They milled uncertainly in the shadow of the pod, heads moving as hundreds of eyes scanned hopelessly in search of more permanent refuge. And, though Chalker had long since come to believe the absurdities of this city, could no longer surprise him. Even he was taken aback by the sight of the new arrival's uniforms. There must be a shortage of paper clips and prophylactics, De Vere said. Now they are sending us painted lambs to the slaughter. They look like toy soldiers. Several hundred guardsmen, standing all but doomed in the middle of no man's land, each wearing a powder blue monstrosity of a uniform, festooned with a dazzling array of gold braids and epaulets, and topped with a tall pillbox hat bearing what appeared to be a feather. Toy soldiers, delivered into the most coverless section of no man's land, an empty wasteland that, for them, might as well have been in hell. Still, toy soldiers or not, Chalker could only hope they knew how to run. Target uh, makes the range at 600 metres, Sergeant, awaiting your instructions. Keep the lines of battery command open, Grishin. At the command mark, I want you to give them that range and tell them to hit it with everything they've got. Confirm. 600 metres, Sergeant. With everything they've got. At the command, mark. All of the troops. At the command, fire. I want suppression fire aimed at the orc lines. 
You have my command. Fire! From every foxhole and trench, the company opened up with lasgun, missile and mortar. At this range, the chances of hitting anything were slim, but all Chalka wanted was to encourage the orcs to keep their heads down long enough for the new arrivals to escape. The only problem was, so far, the toy soldiers showed no sign of moving. A shell rebounded off the hull of the pod as the orc gunners finally found their range. Seeing two of their own cut down by shrapnel, the toy soldiers finally seemed to get the message. They began to run towards the human lines, legs carrying them with a speed born of desperation as bullets and shells flew all around them. 600 metres to go, and men fell and died in great waves, bodies pierced by shrapnel and bullets, or else just ripped to bloody pieces by blasts. 400 metres now, and already more than half were dead. Give them smoke, Joker yelled into his comlink. I want smoke now! In answer, there came a flurry of grenades and mortar fire. Then in seconds, all Chalka could see before him was a drifting white wall of smoke. A desperate gambit. If the toy soldiers could reach cover of the smoke, they might survive. But the same smoke cloud could offer cover to the orcs as well. Sergeant, Auspex reads movement in the Orc lines. They are advancing into no man's land. The line to battery command is open and ready, Sergeant. Let me give the order. You have your instructions, Grishin. Wait. There, finally, he could see human figures emerging through the fog of smoke. Five, six, eight. Perhaps no more than two dozen men left from hundreds, stumbling gratefully to safety at last. Sergeant, Auspex reads a large Orc force moving towards us on foot. You must let me order the bombardment. There are thousands... Chelka was about to give the order, his lips moving to frame the words, when he saw something that set him cursing in disbelief. There, amid the smoke, he saw the figure of a single remaining soldier, a last straggler who, spurning the chance to run for cover, turned instead to fire his las pistol towards the unseen horde of approaching orcs hidden somewhere in the smoke cloud behind him. A fool who probably deserved everything that was coming. You have my command, Grishin, Chalka yelled, already out of the trench and running. Mark! Half a dozen footsteps, and already in the distant air above him, the screaming of falling shells could be heard. A dozen, two dozen steps, and the screaming grew louder. Reaching the straggler, Chalka grabbed him by the scruff of the neck, giving him a swift kick in the backside by way of persuasion. Then, dragging his gasping cargo back to the parapet, Chalka threw him into the trench and leapt down on top of him, just as the first of the screaming shells began its final death dive shriek. A shriek that reached its crescendo in a sudden cacophony of explosions that set the ground shaking. Now, thought Chalka, hugging the straggler to him at the floor of the trench, assuming the barrage does not fall short, We may just survive this. And if we do, it will be my great pleasure to kick this stupid bastard in the arse again. For long moments, the bombardment continued, close enough to send clods of frozen earth falling into the trench, an eternity of ragged heartbeats and racing pulses. Then, abruptly, the explosions stopped. Within an instant, Chalka was on his feet, scanning no man's land for orcs. The barrage had blown away the last of the smoke and he saw the normally grey landscape was now painted with dark green blood and body parts. It made a pleasant contrast. Their luck had held and artillery had seen off the attack. Sergeant, it's Corporal Grishin, Devere said, stubby fingers fiddling at the comlink in his ear as Chelka realised he had lost his own comlink somewhere in no man's land. Look out to report the Orc survivors have returned to their lines. Also, we have received orders from Sector Command as to the disposition of the new troops. They are to be attached to our company. And Sergeant, Grishin says according to command, we should find our new company commander among the reinforcements, uh, Lieutenant Loranus. Thank Grishin for the news, De Vere, said Chalka. But tell him he may want to advise Sector Command our new company commander is probably lying dead with the majority of his men out there in no man's land. Not at all, Sergeant. I assure you, your new company commander is still very much alive. Turning, Chalka saw the straggler getting to his feet, and now he had the chance to see the man clearly. He saw that he wore a single gold bar insignia at his collar. Lieutenant's bars. It looked like kicking him in the arse again was out of the question. One big line, Sergeant. The lieutenant said, jabbing an unbending finger at the map before him. That 
is the best way to defend our position. One big line, and we will break the orcs like waves against the rocks. Two days had passed, and Chalkas stood with Grishin and Lieutenant Loranus in the command dugout around a map of the company's defences. Two days, and now the unveiling of Loranus's grand design had forced Chelka to a re-evaluation. His new lieutenant was not just a fool, he was a madman. Of course, a great deal of work is required. Loranus continued. But the failings of the present system, this array of trenches and foxholes in which our men hide like so many rats, should be self-evident. If we are to break the orc resolve, we need a show of strength. We must concentrate our forces in a single great trench running the length of the sector, protected by minefields and barbed wire. Perhaps the lieutenant was simple-minded. It was the only explanation Chelka could think of which made any sense. Already two days under Loranus's command had been enough to turn Chelka's initial dislike of the man into deep loathing. Loranus was a by-the-book soldier, a shrill martinet who, Chelka was sure, would probably soil his uniform if he ever saw an orc. And that damned uniform, that was another thing again. Despite repeated urgings, Loranus had refused to dispense with his sniper bait uniform or even wear a greatcoat to cover it. Well, Sergeant, you have an opinion? We don't use mines anymore, sir. It only encourages the orcs to take prisoners and drive them across the minefields to clear them. Then, when they ran out of prisoners... They'd use Gretchen instead. Either way, minefields don't work. Hmm. We will use punji sticks then, Sergeant. Or pitfall traps. These are just details. There is a bigger picture here. Yes, sir, there is. With your permission, Lieutenant, I think it is time Corporal Grishin went to see if Combs has received any new messages. Loranus paused, looking at Chalka's weather-beaten face with searching eyes. Then, with a nod, he indicated Grishin should go, waiting until the corporal was out of earshot before he spoke once more. <sighs> All right then, Sergeant. We are alone. What is it you have to say? Permission to speak frankly, sir? Chalka asked. At Loranus's gesture, he continued, choosing his words carefully. With all due respect, sir... Wouldn't it be wiser if you waited to acclimatise yourself fully to conditions here before making wholesale changes to our defences? I believe I am acclimatised, as you put it, Sergeant. Lorana said, looking Chelka squarely in the eye now. And it is my intention these changes should be made without further delay. Should I take it you find some fault in my plans? Yes, sir. Our firing trenches and foxholes are spread out for a reason. Same as they are in every other sector of the city. We do it that way to catch the orcs in multiple fields of fire and cut them down before they can get close. At the same time, because there isn't any one single strong point, if a trench is about to be overrun, the men in it can pull back without fear of the whole line collapsing. Are you telling me it is deliberate policy to give ground to the enemy? We don't give them anything, Lieutenant. We lend it to them just long enough for the men in the other trenches to shoot them down. Then we take it back. No matter how you dress it up, Sergeant, it is a retreat, and retreat smacks of cowardice. Call it what you want, Lieutenant. This is Brucherock. War here is not like what they tell you about in the Scalarium. I am well acquainted with the realities of warfare, Sergeant. Loranus said, his face flushed and his lips tight. My homeworld has a martial tradition that dates back centuries. And for generations, my family has committed its sons to the service of the Emperor. And you have personal experience fighting orcs, sir. Ugh, I do not see how that is relevant. Loranus said. A dangerous edge had entered his voice. But this was too important for Chelka to back down. You talk about a show of strength and breaking the orc resolve, Lieutenant. Well, there's only one way I know to break an orc's resolve, and that's to kill him. As for a show of strength, take it from me, they're stronger than we are. The one thing you don't want is to end up going hand to hand with an orc. Let them shoot at you all day. Chances are they'll miss. But go hand to hand and you'll end up being fed your own liver. That's what this is all about, Lieutenant. Put our men in one big line. We've had multiple fields of fire and we've nowhere to retreat to. And you're giving the orcs the chance to get close by sheer weight of numbers. And if you do that... You might as well give them the keys to the city right now. You sound as though you are frightened of the orc, Sergeant. Loranus said, his expression dark. Yes, I am, Lieutenant. 
I've always made it a policy to be terrified of anything that outnumbers me 500 to 1. For a moment, struggling visibly to control his temper, Loranus was silent. But Chelka knew it was only the lull before the storm. Any second now, Loranus would either dress him down or tell him to shut up and follow orders. Worse, he might even summon Grishin back and order Chelka to be put under arrest for insubordination. Whatever the result, the lieutenant would have his way. Their defences would be relocated to one big line and within a day at most everyone in this sector would be dead. All because Command had decided to shackle them with a madman. But no matter the folly of his plans, in the end Loranus was the officer and Chelka the sergeant. The lieutenant could send the whole company skipping naked towards the orcs and no one would stop him. Unless... Sergeant! Lieutenant! You must come quickly! There's something going on over in the orc lines. It was Grishin. His voice over the comlink shrill to the point of panic. An unlikely guardian angel. But for now, Chelka would take what he could get. It seems we are needed elsewhere, Sergeant. We shall have to postpone this matter until later. But understand, this does not end here. As you say, sir, Chucker replied, picking up his shotgun and shooking a shell into the breach. This is not over. Loranus turned away, moving towards the dugout exit with Chelka two steps behind him. Then, stepping outside, Chelka saw something which only confirmed his doubts as to the lieutenant's sanity. Incredibly, instead of running or crouching, Loranus went marching across the open ground towards the trenches as though it were a parade ground. Bad enough to be wearing that sniper bait uniform, thought Chelka, but the fool doesn't even have the sense to run or keep his head down. Not that the thought of some Gretchen sniper blowing the Lieutenant Fool's head off caused him any great concern. But there was always the danger the damned Gretch would miss and hit someone else. You hear it? Grishin's voice was a dry whisper. That noise from the alt lines. Engines. The sound could be heard clearly now, drifting across no man's land from behind the barricades on the orc side. A growing cacophony of revving motors, grinding gears and rumbling exhausts. The sound of engines... And engines meant only one thing. Armour. I, I, I don't understand. Loranus said, staring towards the sound in utter confusion. Intelligence reports stated categorically the orcs had exhausted their last reserves of fuel. Could be they found an old Promethium cache somewhere, Chelka said. Either way, it doesn't matter. The reports were wrong, Lieutenant. And from the sound of those engines, we don't have much time to get ready. Yes. Loranus said. You are right, of course, Sergeant. We need to make preparations. Looking into the lieutenant's eyes, Chalka realised the man had no idea how to proceed. Confronted with an unforeseen situation, Loranus was floundering. Artillery, lieutenant, Chalka prompted. Of course, Loranus said, his imperious facade abruptly restored as though somewhere a distant general had flicked a switch. Artillery fire. Grishin, contact battery command and tell them I want an immediate carpet bombardment of the area. Directly in front of the orc lines. Then, as Grishin hurried towards the comms dugout, the lieutenant turned towards Chelka once more. I'm sure, like me, you believe in leading from the front, Sergeant. I suggest you take up position on the east of the line, while I take the west. It would be a tragedy, after all, if either of us were to wander inadvertently into the other's field of fire. Without a word... Chelka turned and ran, crouching towards the forward firing trench on his side of the defences. Inside, Devere and Belavan were already preparing for the assault. The big man was checking the pump pressure of the heavy flamer before him, while Devere flicked the safety off his lasgun and sighted in on no man's land. I'm pleased to announce we are open for business, Sergeant, Devere said, glancing over his shoulder as Chelka jumped into the trench. Just in time, too. From the sound of it, we have a busy day ahead of us. Yes, we have, Devere. But for now, I want you both to put the camo cover back on the flamer and keep your heads down. No offence, Sergeant, Devere said beside him. Belavan stared dumbly at Chelka. But I have found orcs rarely drop dead of their own accord. You have to shoot them first. Perhaps in your close study of the orcs, you've also noticed they rarely do much in the way of reconnaissance before an assault, Chelka replied. If we don't shoot at them, they're likely to think the trench is empty. And if they do, they will concentrate their attack here. Then, once they get close enough, we will spring a surprise. Not much of a surprise, Sergeant, Devere said, 
Tigerish smile revealing a mouthful of stained and crooked teeth. Three men with only a shotgun, lasgun and heavy flamer between them. Still, if the orcs get too close, we can always try having Balava and fart them to death. Overhead, the air began to scream with the sound of shells. Grishin had called in the barrage, shrapnel and explosives, turning the area in front of the orc lines into a quagmire. But it would take more than that to stop the orcs from coming. The best the bombardment could do was thin out their numbers. Confirmation from all lookouts, Grishin said. The orcs are coming. No one, with eyes or ears, could miss them. From the orc lines, the engine noises reached a crescendo, momentarily drowning out even the artillery barrage as dozens of orc vehicles smashed through their own barricades and sped into no man's land. A motley mechanised army of scratch-built vehicles, tracks, trucks, bikes and buggies gunned their engines forward to come roaring across the frozen mud. In seconds, they were past the limits of the bombardment, leaving a third of their number burning behind them, a third already gone, but it mattered not at all. The other two thirds just kept on coming. All troops, upon my command... Lurana said, calm and even over the comlink. Fire! A fusillade of missiles, las beams and mortar rounds hurtled into no man's land. Some found their marks and more vehicles exploded, but many beams glanced off armour. Missiles failed, mortar rounds fell short. The motorised horde kept coming. With grim satisfaction, Chelka saw the bulk of them were headed his way. Wait, he told the others. I want them close. The death toll mounted as the other guardsmen continued to fire, but the remaining orcs kept coming in a mad dash to be the first to the slaughter. 100 metres, 80, 50, 25 metres now and closing. 20, now, said Chalka. Before the sound of the order was gone, Balavan was on his feet, moving with a speed that belied his size. He pulled the camo cover away, his finger already on the trigger of the flamer. He fired and an oncoming war track suddenly disappeared in an expanding cone of fire. It exploded, but Balavan was already on to another target, and another, and another. One by one, speeding vehicles became fiery death traps for their crews, screaming orcs leaping overboard as around them their comrades crashed and burned. And still, Balavan kept working the flamer, a bright finger of fire turning vehicle after vehicle into an inferno. And all the time, beside him, Chelka and Devere worked the triggers of their own guns like madmen, trying to make up for their lack of numbers with sheer volume of fire. Before long, all Chalka could see in front of the trench was a rising curtain of flame. All he could hear was the screams of orcs. All he could smell was the stench of burning flesh. He kept on firing. Reloading! Balavan yelled as the flamer suddenly sputtered and died, his fat hands already working to attach the fuel line to a new canister. And with a machine-like efficiency born of long practice, Chalka and Devere sent half a dozen frag grenades into the flames to buy Balavan the seconds he needed. But then they were machines. Machines made for the killing of orcs. The flamer sputtered once more, then spat fire again, sending more orcs screaming to their gods. And even through the haze of battle, Chelka could see his plan was working. Having concentrated their attack here, the orcs had become log-jammed. Already their assault elsewhere in the sector was faltering, and guardsmen from other trenches were able to add their fire to back up Chelka and Devere. It was the oldest tactic in Brucherock. Offer the orcs an open door and slam it shut in their faces. The oldest tactic, and yet it worked every time. Then, just as Chelka began to think he might have survived yet another battle... He heard a message over the comlink that made him think perhaps orcs were not so gullible after all. Lieutenant! Grishin's voice crackled through the static. Look out reports. More orcs advancing towards us on foot through no man's land. Sweet emperor. Their armour was only the first wave. For a moment, there was only silence over the comlink. Then Chelka heard Loranus uh, give an order of stark, staring madness. All troops! Fix bayonets! and advance into no man's land. You hear me? Forward! For the Emperor! In the trench, no one moved. Chelka, Devere and Balavan stood, staring at each other in disbelief. Turning to look at the other trenches, Chelka could see they were not alone. Out of the whole company, only one man had left the safety of his trench. One man who now charged forward single-handedly towards the army of orcs, hidden somewhere in the smoke. The only man who had followed the order was the man who had given it. Lieutenant Loranus. Alone, 
While the troops he commanded stood watching him in incomprehension, Loranus leapt out of his trench and charged into no man's land, with bullets flying all around him. Coming to a burning war track, he vaulted onto its hull, pushed a dead Gretchen out of the way, then grabbed the vehicle's twin stubbers and turned them screaming on a horde of approaching orcs. One man, compelled by some unknown inner demon to an act of suicidal madness. It was the bravest thing Chelka had ever seen. What are you waiting for? Chalker heard himself yell over the comlink. Are you going to leave him to fight the orcs on his own? That's your company commander out there. Charge! Before he even knew what he was doing, Chalker was on his feet with Devere and Belavin beside him. Together they charged into no man's land with guns blazing, every other man in the company close behind them. A hundred men, inspired by the same madness as their commander, charging screaming to certain death. Then, for the second time in a day, Chalka saw something incredible. The orcs broke and ran. Barely believing they were still alive, Chalka and the others halted, looking at the backs of the retreating orcs in dumb disbelief. Then there came the sound of a single voice, soon joined by another and another, until every man in the company, Chalka included, was cheering Lieutenant Loranus's name. And from his vantage above them on the burning hull of the war track, Lorana smiled and raised his las pistol above his head in a salute of triumph. Then the bullet struck. Somewhere out in no man's land, a Gretchen sniper found his spiteful mark. The impact pitching Lorana's forward off the war track as a fist-sized spray of red gore erupted from the right side of his chest. Chalker was by his side in seconds, his hands desperately trying to stem the flow of blood from the lieutenant's chest as he screamed for a medic. Tell them, tell them it wasn't true. My family, <coughs> we were loyal. Tell them. You will tell them yourself, Lieutenant. Chalka said, not realising he was shouting. And you can show them the medal you're going to get for this. And not posthumously, Lieutenant. You hear me? This is no more than a scratch. In a couple of weeks you'll be saluting when they pin that medal on you. Do you hear me, Lieutenant? But his only answer came with a bloody-lipped and enigmatic smile. Loranus was already dead. He had expected questions or another beating, but having finished his story... Chalka found himself left in silence as the Commissar's attention returned to his data slate once more. Minutes passed. The only sound in the room was the quiet whirring of the Vox recorder and the scratching of a stylus as the Commissar began to write something on the screen of the data slate. Or perhaps it was hours. Chalka could not be sure. He could only sit there, wondering. Surely there must be more to it than this. If the Commissar only wanted to ask him about Loranus's heroism... Why put him through this torment? Why the arrest? The beating? Why bring him here at all? Then, Valk switched off the Valk's recorder, a sudden click sounding like a gunshot after so long a silence. You may go, Sergeant, the Commissar said. Then, seeing Chalka staring blankly at him, he continued, Having read your most recent battle report, I was understandably concerned to see you had recommended a traitor for posthumous commendation. But having heard your account firsthand... I can see you had no sinister motive. It was simply a regrettable lack of judgment. I am satisfied. You were an innocent in this affair. As I said, Sergeant, you may go. Still shell-shocked, Chelka stood and turned to leave, still half expecting the guards to drag him back into the chair at any moment. Then, as he reached the door, he could not help but give one last look at the Commissar sitting at his desk. Is there something else, Sergeant? Forgive my asking, Commissar. When you said a traitor, did you mean Lieutenant Loranus? Yes. Some months ago, a member of the Lieutenant's family, a distant cousin, I believe, was denounced as a traitor to the Imperium. Of course, as is usual in these cases, his relatives were also purged. All except your Lieutenant. Apparently, some administrative oversight led to the order for his execution being delayed long enough for him to seek refuge among troops bound for this planet. No doubt he hoped to spread heresy and dissent here, 
but on this occasion it would seem the orcs have actually done us a service. If nothing else, they have saved us a bullet, at least. They had given him his clothes back, and his weapons, but all the same, as he limped alone back to the front lines, Chucker felt little sense of triumph. Even cheating the gallows seemed no great victory. This was Brucherock. At best, he had lived to die another day. Still, he had received better than Lieutenant Loranus. It seemed strange how he had gone so quickly from loathing the man to respecting him. And now, now they said the lieutenant was a traitor. Jugger was too tired to think about it. Perhaps he would consider it tomorrow. He smelt the familiar stench on the wind, and Chalker realised he was approaching the corpse pyres once more. For a moment, he contemplated going the long way round, but his body ached and it would have added another two kilometres to his journey. Besides, the pyres seemed to have burned down now, most of them a little more than smouldering piles of ash. Of course, new pyres were already being built. In Brucherock, corpses were never in short supply. But for now, the smoke and stink had lessened. It was then... As he made his way past the newly constructed mound of unburned corpses that Chalker caught a glimpse of something, a flash of gold and blue among a mountain of green flesh. In a split second it was gone as a masked guardsman put a torch to the pyre, the whole mound disappearing in a scarlet haze of fire. But Chalker did not need to see it twice. He knew what it was already, a golden epaulette on the shoulder of the ridiculous powder blue uniform of Lieutenant Loranus, consigned to the flames with its owner, no doubt at the order of Commissar Valk. It did not matter that the lieutenant had given his life defending this city. Bruce Rock was sacred soil. There could be no final resting place here for a man condemned as a traitor. No hero's burial for him. Only a red reward. Well, there we go, everybody. Thank you for watching. I hope you did enjoy that. Bit grim, innit? But I'm back now, and for those of you watching in the future, this will mean nothing, but for those of you who are watching at the present and have been watching for a while, I know there's been a bit of a, a lag in between video production. I'm getting back into things now. There'll be a new video coming out soon, a big law video coming. I'm not going to talk about it too much because I might change my mind halfway through. But anyway, something's coming big. And uh, yeah, I just had to get back into the flow of things. I won't go into personal details, obviously, because like I'm not insane and um, you don't need to know. But basically, I've just had a baby, as many of you do know. Uh, that's the only thing I'm going to say on that. But uh, I've moved house as well, so it's just one thing after another. It's just really bogged me down on everything, and I've really had to get back into this mindset. Thank you to my friend who lent me his uh, voice for this uh, this this video. <laughs> and, I, you know, it's good fun, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, thank you to everybody who's been supporting the channel and continue to support the channel in this hiatus that I've been on for the last couple of months. Uh, every, every, all of you are YouTube uh, channel members, all of you are Patreons, all of you are on uh, Subscribestar. Thank you ever so much for continuing to support the channel despite the lack of content. And um, yeah, more content is coming, don't worry. Your, your faith will be rewarded with more videos very, very soon. Also, if you're listening to the podcast version of this, I have uploaded a couple of things and done a couple of streams in the intervening period since the last video was uploaded back in March, I think it was, or maybe it was later than that, I forget. But um, if you're listening on the podcast, apologies for the delay. If you do want to keep up with the channel and the place to find out information about where videos that are coming up and stuff like that, remember to subscribe on the YouTube channel if you can. And um, that's the best place to find the stuff. Plus as well, I generally put the stuff on the YouTube channel like a week before I put it on the podcast. Sometimes it depends when I upload it to the uh, podcast uh, feed. Is that what it, is that what it's called? I think it's a, <laughs> I think that's what it's called. But yes, you are all appreciated podcast people, and uh, I have remembered you. And yes, stuff will be uploaded regularly soon. It's just uh, some of the things I do on YouTube. I don't always upload to the podcast feed. Obviously, some of them are just like you know, shall we shall we say think pieces? You know, just me rambling about something fun uh, that I found interesting or whatever, uh, or uh, you know, live streams playing games or just waffling about like new releases and stuff like that in in Games Workshop things. Anyway. Yeah, subscribe on the YouTube channel if you're a podcast person. If you're wondering where the where, where the videos have all gone, where the where the uh, where the the new podcast episodes have gone, it's on there. But yes, thank you everybody on YouTube. Please do like the video and remember to subscribe if you're not subscribed. And let me know in the comments what you think. All these things really help a small channel like mine get ahead. And blah blah blah. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go on anymore. It's enough shilling. That's enough begging. All right, I'll be back again very very soon. And um, yeah, this was a good one. This is a classic. And I think also is uh, the sort of a short story precursor to the novel 24 Hours, which is about, um, I think, the same city and the same 
Sergeant Chelka shows up again and uh, it's about like this city Bruce Rock for a new soldier they're only expected to live 24 hours basically and it's a whole thing about this guy it's it's kind of the same premise to be completely honest but um, he lands on this planet and it's his 24 hours in this siege you know this trench siege uh, very much like Leningrad I guess you'd say that sort of vibe it's going for or Stalingrad I suppose but anyway you know that's what they're drawing on anyway good fun so, yeah, um, I'll be back again very, very soon. Thank you all again for watching. And, uh, yeah, thanks very much for your patience. I'm back in action now, more or less. Stuff is going to come regular. And um, that's it. All right. Ta-ra.